I think we can we can start moving on to just quick introductions that me and uh, Comrade Takia uh, are going to do, maybe five minutes each, and and then we can go into the discussion about the, on on the readings um, that that we advertised, and and hopefully everybody had access to those readings. But if you didn't, it's fine. We can obviously just just discuss things as, as they come. Um, so yeah, Comrade Takia, if you if you want to just quickly, briefly introduce yourself and and also introduce your part of uh, of the discussion as well, please. Okay. Um, so I guess maybe some some more people join. So I'll just go over it a little bit again. Um, I've been kind of active in in movement building since uh, 2017, 2016, something like that. Um, uh, got arrested for my role in taking down the Confederate statue here in um, North Carolina. Um, I've been building this organization, Riot Revolutionary Organization, Revolutionary International Organization de Trabajadores since um, last year, coming up on the year anniversary of this uh, organization being off the ground. Uh, some of the stuff I take part in is um, political education, direct action, and, um, and um, our community um, urban garden gardening initiative that we got going on right now. Um, so yeah, that's me. Um, just here to kind of offer um, my perspective, um, a black socialist perspective on some of these readings and stuff like that. So wait, wait, wait. So, so are we like um, like you said before, like you were in a organization, they were Leninists, correct? Yes, this was a Marxist Leninist organization that I was uh, once. Yeah. Uh, um um so like are we doing maoism or like you know like what's like the communism classification because um, there's like different theories and stuff like that i'm a maoist personally thank you comrade chelsea i i would say that we uh as anti-conquista uh, we're, we're marxist leninist uh but we're you know we're we're open to other comrades uh, who are who are communists or not communists or socialists, whatever uh, persuasion. Um, but the, the the idea of this discussion is just to you know um, talk about uh, communist and socialist ideology and how we can how we can use it to, as a tool for for the current climate. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give a, a very brief introdu introduction and then we can move on to the uh, discussion on the readings that we that we sent out to to peeps. Um, all right, so thank you for coming along today. Um, as advertised, this study group's objective is to explore the current uprising from a revolutionary commun communist perspective. And to be clear, the rebellion is in itself uh, revolutionary because it's demanding justice and change. But what we want to add to this rebellion is guidance for those of us who consider ourselves communist, socialist, socialist or who maybe don't identify as such, but who sympathize with our cause. What we want to add to this rebellion and the conversation around it is that the racial injustice and the violence that black and brown communities face in the United States uh, and across the Western world it cannot be disconnected, cannot be separated from the suffering of the people of the uh, global South under the current global under the current global capitalist structure. Uh, we see this as a critical task as we are one of the only, if not the only, Latin American communist organization in, in the diaspora. Um, and what we want to add to the rebellion and to the conversation around it is that the, is that the violence that black and brown uh, people face in the United States and across the Western world um, is something that has developed through capitalism. Um, at Anticonquista, Anti we believe that Latin Americans, the oppression that Latin Americans face across the West is 
part and parcel of the capitalist system. You can't separate it. As the founding father of Latin American communism taught us almost a uh, hundred years ago, he, he would say something like racism uh, developed only because of capitalism and capitalism is only possible because of racism. Uh, more concretely, uh, it was colonialism, the exploitation of black and brown communities around the world that allowed the modern form of capitalism or modern capitalism to, to develop. So under these circumstances, we see the urgency to direct Latin Americans working together with our black comrade, comrades towards a communist understanding. We don't want to sit here and criticize other activists and non-activists taking part in the rebellion, but rather we want to add our voices as an option for those who are open to it. The study and discussion today is an effort to give ourselves and anyone interested guidance on what should be done in this very important moment in history. I said we are one of the only Latin American communist groups available to those of us in the diaspora because the vast majority of communist groups that are found in the West are white-led, often Eurocentric in their, in their analysis, and often even blatantly racist and pro-imperialism. We therefore believe that although we're going, uh, we are going to be called revisionist by Eurocentric communists, we, be, we do believe it, that Marxism, um, we do believe that Marxism must necessarily be applied to our local conditions, as well as taking our unique historical experiences into account. Even so, we think of ourselves as Marxists in that we study our, our reality from a materialist rather than an idealist point of view. So the purpose of this first session is exactly that, uh, to help us differentiate between liberal idealism, which is a strong current right now uh, in the protest, um, and revolutionary material and a re revolutionary materialist analysis, which naturally leads us to take a socialist and communist path. Um, and then next week, we'll be looking at how we can con combine ideology with practice in the context of revolutionary, uh, in the context of the revolutionary uprisings that we we're experiencing today. Um, and like I said. The next sessions we're going to look into um, hopefully being on, on more secure platforms where we can, we can discuss freely. You know, we, we're, not illegal, we're not an illegal organization. Uh, we, we keep things legal. We, we want to keep people safe. Uh, so it's important to us to, you know, to keep the, these discussions safe and, and private, not because we, we think we're doing anything illegal, or that we, you know, that the the police or the FBI can come after us and and um, charge us with anything because we haven't done anything. Uh, but we're interested in in privacy, uh, obviously for the sake of not being um, spied on and not being infiltrated. Um, so yeah, with that said, I I now want to open up the discussion to the readings. That we that we sent out. I'm I'm aware some comrades may may have not um, got access to those readings because we we got a lot of um, we got a lot of uh, uh, people on on social media, uh, you know, contact contacting us, and and it was difficult to you know to try and get the readings out to everyone. But hopefully, everybody uh, or most people did did uh, uh, receive the readings and. And even if you didn't, of course, you can, you can also uh, join in the conversation and, and say your piece as well. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd, li I'd now like to open up. Um, we can start discussing whatever readings people, people found interesting or comments that people have or questions that people have. Um, yeah. I think, it, I think in order to, to perhaps make this a bit um, easier because there's, there's quite a lot of people on here. If, uh, if comrades either, now uh, comrades can, can go ahead and unmute themselves and, and just ex 
just say that they want to talk and, and we can we can organize it like that. Comrade Takia? Yeah. Do you have any any analysis on the readings? Are we going to start uh, in order? Are we going that way? It doesn't necessarily have to be in order. You can you can start wherever. Okay, so I th I'll, we can start with the, the Walter Rodney, the, the first one on the list, because I thought that one was pretty um, interesting. Uh, just going to open it up here on my computer screen. Cool. So I think it, I think it's important is a, is a, um, it's a, a, a historical thread in, in Marxism and obviously uh, Walter Rodney, for those who don't know, was a Guyanese revolutionary and, you know, his take is, he's, he's one of the, he's one of the first um, black uh, socialists who who, uh, like Mariategui for Latin America, attempts to adapt Marxism to the African condition and, and African experience. And I think that's, you know, is, is kind of like what we're trying to do here is how can we apply communism and socialism to our, our own experiences? Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, some of our, some of our community, some people in our communities, you know, at, at least I'll speak for myself in the Latino community or the, the Latin American community, we're often told that uh, Marxism is a European ideology and therefore is, is, it can't be adapted or it can't be, um, you can't use Marxism to explain the, the history of Latin American people. And, um, I think Walter Rodney, as well as other read, other authors in the readings, do a great job at kind of debunking that idea and, and showing that Marxism is a, a scientific theory that can be applied. Um, and, and it shouldn't be applied as if it were a universal ideology that, that you know, a, a, a one, one glove that can fit all but rather a, a scientific theory that can, can be applied and adapted uh, to, our, to our history to, and to our local conditions. Um, so I thought, you know, I, I added that reading to, to the list because I, I thought we could, um, as Walter Rodney did in his reading, try to adapt Marxism to the experience of African people in, in the Caribbean and in Africa, and as well as the, the diaspora. For me, um, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just gonna give a little bit of my um, my thoughts on this reading. For me, it was really interesting, where he talks about um, the question of like what is the relevance of Marxism, how even that question alone it, it flows from a bourgeois framework, right? And because we live in a, a bourgeois society, a society that's you know uh, we live under a, a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, right? that this is the framework from which we all start out until until that that until the shoe is put on the other foot as he says when when we um when we come to to a materialist understanding then it becomes well what is the what is the need for a bourgeois ideology right instead of what is the need for marxism and um i also find it interesting uh in this piece he talks about uh the mistakes of Kwame Nkrumah and um basically trying to find a third way or a middle path right between um between uh social scientific socialism and uh a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie which we currently have and i find this interesting because um you know it's a conversation that's relevant even today you know a lot of people are asking like well what does this european ideology have to do with people in in the third world right um and he goes on to talk about how you know, millions, maybe by now billions of people throughout, you know, throughout the world, majority of which are people who are black and brown have used this 
ideology to to struggle for freedom or who have taken this ideology um, to to guide them in the fight for liberation. Um, so I found that 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 analysis interesting, and also this um, concept of se separating social sciences from from natural or physical science is also a, a, a bourgeois framework, right? So if we're gonna reject um, if we're gonna reject European social sciences then why aren't we rejecting um, European physical and natural sciences, right? It, the sooner we should be um, just as soon uh, or just as ready to reject um, electricity because of, um, because of Con, Con Edison's role in, in, you know, proliferating electricity as we are to reject Marxism, if that's the case. And I felt like that was a really good, that was like a really concrete um, example as to why um, accepting Marxism isn't part of like the white man's agenda as it's like often packaged to colonize people, right? Exactly, yeah, exactly, comrade. Yeah. Does anybody else have any any comments on, on that reading, on Walter Rodney's reading? Everyone forgets that, um, like, you know, Stalin, Mao, Marx, you know, like bourgeois, they didn't make, they didn't make Marxism technically. They just saw there was something wrong. <laughs> yeah. And are we going, like, we going to, um, you said it wasn't going to be that advanced. So are we still going to be talking about dialects, material reality, etc. We could, we can talk about whatever you want, comrade, whatever the comrades want. Um, but, but let me remind you all that the, the, the purpose of this session is to um, apply this theory and, and, and this, these ideas that uh, Rodney and Guevara and Mao and, and Lenin, uh, the readings that we did, apply, try to kind of understand these ideas and apply them to the current situation, you know. And, and in the spirit of Walter Rodney or or for us Latin Americans in the, in the spirit of Mariategui, who adopted Marxism uh, as a revolutionary theory to try and liberate their people. Um, right now we see the, the uprisings in, in the United States and, um, you know, it's, it's focused around black people and as it should be because, you know, it, it's, what what caused the spark for this was the the, the atrocious atrocious killing of uh, George Floyd, uh, but it's also relevant to us Latin Americans and and other oppressed communities within within the United States um, to try and understand uh, communism in in order to to see kind of a, a a clear path of what else can be done rather than the the you know the same old. Um, the same old uh, kind of liberal ideas of uh, wishing it away, or, or or kind of holding hands with the with the people who oppress us, and and asking them, and 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 and, I, and I'm also not discounting, you know, the the activism uh, and the pressure uh, on the government to try and um, change or, or give us some reform so that these immediate things don't happen, uh, but but with always keeping in mind the, the longer term goals and, and the deeper, more structural uh, roots of the problem. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd just say like, let's, let's keep the conversation, let's try and keep our analysis uh, always with that in mind, like how can we adapt socialism and communism to, to the present moment and to the present situation? Um, yeah. Hello, hello, comrades. Comrades. Sorry. Oh, go, go ahead, uh, Chris and Natasha. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, this, this is, is uh, Chris, Chris from New York, New York City. City. Uh, I'm, I'm a member of, of the United Panther Movement. Movement. Um, um, thank, thank, you for, uh, thank you for, for uh, thank you to the last comrade, comrade um, for, for reviewing the Walter Rodney article. article. Uh, I wasn't I able, was able to read it completely, completely and I just had, had a question. Sorry, sorry, to, uh, sorry to interrupt, Chris. There's a bit of an echo. I'm not sure if, is it just me or does everybody else hear it? Yeah, there's an echo. Comrade Chris and, and Natasha, maybe I'm not sure if you've got two devices open or, or something or. Okay, okay give me, I'll, I'll, I'll comment, comment later. later. I'll try to fix it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Comrade. 
Um, it would be in the meantime, I could go, go ahead. Please <laughs> that. I kind of going off of what um, the previous person said on the Walter Rodney. I didn't get to read the Walter Rodney one, but um, I didn't get to read the Walter Rodney uh bit but it kind of connected to the Che Guevara part where he was saying that um not now please can you can you sorry um the the bit that Che Guevara had where he was basically saying that Marxism is as uh sort of natural as Newtonian physics or he had somebody he was referring to in biology that I don't know about but kind of like that um consistent theory that it wasn't it's not just some sort of European ideology but just a natural thing and if somebody happens to have written about it and defined it um and then there was also a comment on sort of making actual advances instead of just holding hands like usual and it kind of reminds me both of the same Che Guevara part where he was saying um the revolution there was revolutionary action that wasn't necessarily based on theory and the theory sort of came later but the general understanding of the, the problems that people face is still consistent enough that it'll lead to theory. And then kind of piggybacking off of that where Mao was saying, you know, all these different versions of liberalism and that currently the liberalism that we're seeing, I think is people just taking a knee with the police, which, you know, in theory is all well and good, but it's really just an action of, you know, keeping the peace and not doing anything or moving forward and actually making systemic deep changes in the first place. Yeah, for sure, exactly, yeah. Any other comrades wanna wanna chip in? Yeah, I think um, go ahead. It's, it's Anisha. Thank you. Yeah, or actually uh okay, I'll go ahead. Um but I just wanted to speak to the I think the utility of Marxism Leninism in connecting to like the current struggle we're facing right now for Black people in the US is like the piece Marx near the end writes about primitive accumulation and then Lenin takes that and applies that process of primitive accumulation to um, imperialism. And so I think we have to remember that the, the current oppression of black and brown people in the United States is like very much connected to the creation of slavery by capitalism and, and the police state here is very invested in maintaining um, that slave labor through prisons, um, which has transformed the institution of slavery, but it, it very much still exists um, in the same way that, that the global South um, is also exploited for that, for that labor and to keep capital uh, moving and, and growing. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point, uh, Comrade Tanisha. I think um, you know, as as many ideologues have said, um, black and immigrant and brown communities within um, Western nations represent an an kind of an oppressed layer of society. Like the, the you know, our people are at the bottom of society, and therefore are you know kind of like a more revolutionary element of society. Um, there's a, there's also you know the the um, idea that goes all the way back to Marx and Engels that the the more material benefits that that workers achieve uh, from from governments, especially you know workers in more industrialized countries, which uh, obviously is the West, uh, the more benefits they have, the the less likely they they are to to become a revolutionary class, um, and I think in the United States we're seeing you know the uh, the black community is being oppressed, highly oppressed, and that you know even though the the black community in the U.S. Uh, um, some people may see as like a privileged class because they live in the West, um, you know. Like you said, Comrade Tanisha, I think you could, there's a comparison between uh, those communities and the communities in the, in the global south uh, who have been historically historically oppressed. I'm going to go to um, Comrade Black Momrad, <laughs> Black Momrad, who um, 
he's waving his hand. Um, so we're gonna use that feature from, from now on to, to make it easier. I think there's a, there's a feature to raise your hand if you wanna say something. So I'm gonna go to Comrade Black Momrad. Hi, everybody. I am uh, also with uh, Riot Revolt. And um, my perspective on what's going on now is based on lots of years of watching different uprisings, different rebellions, and things like that. And basically, just an analysis of putting uh, Marx or Kay or whoever is writing these different uh, spotlights on Marxism to make you think about what should the revolution look like? Because I think that's what we also need to talk about. Because yes, analysis is important um, and you learn from it, but uh, what do you want your future to actually look like? Because a lot of times we have these uprisings. I've been seeing them personally since um, I was old enough to sit at my, well, listen in the hallway while my parents talked at the table about Reagan and different things like that. And then the, the city workers going on strike in New York City. Um, there was killings with uh, many people throughout Brooklyn, battered, um, chased through the streets by gangs of people. But what happens next? Yes, we make a lot of noise, right? So I was really um, interested in the reading, the last one, that's the list. Um, I'm not sure if you know the name of that. Let me look back. But um, it's called Why We Don't Make Demands. Right. And I thought that was interesting because, uh, like I said, I've seen a lot of uh, uprisings. So my thoughts on that was um, laws can get changed overnight. Remember the Civil Rights Act when they gave us some concessions, like housing laws, which uh, inadvert they gave us the ability to go buy a house, yes, because that's what the people said they wanted, but we didn't have jobs, right? So we named demands that were not uh, conducive to a long-term sustainment of those uh, demands being met because in actuality, segregation was the worst thing that ever happened to black, brown, and any other person virus or anything else that lives on this planet. That was the worst thing that could happen is uh, desegregation, right? So I also think about uh, what about the institution which gave us the redlining in the first place that brought about some of those changes such as the Civil Rights Act of 1968. So they stopped right redlining. Like I said, you couldn't get any jobs, but where do we go now? So now we have everyone's attention Right, we're making a lot of noise, but what do you want the future to look like? Like, um, I think if you paint that brush and then work backwards like an artist, then we could, you know, possibly get to where it is that we need to get to instead of saying, yes, let's talk to the police and work it out, make agreements with them. And then, you know, we're back in the same place where. You know, you can go into an establishment and you can get um, you can get help from a real estate agent, but if you don't have the monies and the funds to, you know, actually purchase the house, those laws changing means nothing. Talk about when is, you know, for instance, like the White House not going to um, stand um or, you know, things like that. But, and when I mean stand, I mean stand on our necks, literally and figuratively. So my thought is we can study analysis and know that when you talk about a uh, revolution, you have to make something else extinct. And how do we make that happen? Thank you, comrade. I've, you know what what the comrade was just was just saying reminds me um you know because th th there's a bit of a, a contradiction in in um che Guevara's reading that we put up um where he says that the Cuban revolution wasn't necessarily um 
you know, concretely Marxist uh, to begin with. They didn't really have a clear ideological path to begin with, and and they were more um, revolutionary in the sense that they wanted change, and 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 they, you know, they were active about making that change without necessarily having those preset ideas. Um, but he he does also say that if they did have a Marxist understanding and, and a clear ideology beforehand, they might have not committed some of the mistakes, political, social, and economic mistakes that, that they made in the beginning. Um, and I think, you know, to relate it back to the situation in the, in the United States, is, it's a very different situation. Um, it's a different situation because, you know, the, the, the size of the situation, um, you know, the, the Cuban revolutionaries were able to defeat the Batistas, the Batista dictatorship and, and their military with, a, with something like 80, 80 um, revolutionaries to begin with, and, and then they started recruiting uh, peasants slowly. Um, but I think the, the situation, we, we, can't, um, we can't take the Cuban experience and the Cuban revolution and, and try to apply it to, to the United States, in my opinion. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's, where, that's where we, I guess, have to try and and think of as as communist revolutionaries, what we try have to try and figure out is how do how do we apply uh, revolutionary communism to the United States, and how how are we going to uh, bring about a more lasting lasting and more profound uh, change? I'm going to go to Comrade U.S. J.J. Um, go ahead, Comrade. Good evening, comrades. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. I am uh, a organizer with All African People's Revolutionary Party, which is interesting that we studied in Krumah, and I'm probably the lone in Krumah's terrace that's on. <laughs> we're, we're very, we're a very small group in the in the Western world, uh, very heavy on the continent. Um, if if you were to go to the Hemba people in Namibia, and you were to tell the Hemba people in Namibia to construct a house. And the Hamba people in Namibia, to construct that house, they used the materials that surrounded them. They would construct a house that would be uh, applicable to the conditions of Namibia. And if you use the same language with the Inuit people of Alaska, the so-called Eskimo, and you told them to build a house, <laughs> then they would build a house that is applicable to the conditions, material conditions, which surround them in their native land. If you go to those individuals with the same conceptual uh, framework of saying, what is this? Both of them would describe what they're doing as building a house. And both of them would describe the materials that they're using as the materials which are applicable for building a house. Um, I use that uh, analogy to, to allow us to understand that although we are all uh, Marxists, although we are all communists, although we're all socialists, although we all fit in that general uh, description uh, and we all are guided by the same principles, uh, the material conditions which surround us um, are the material conditions that we will use to build um, scientific socialism, Pan-Africanism, Marxism, Marxist-Leninism, Maoism, we will we'll use what's around us to build what we need. Um, so if we're talking about how this ideology can be used to guide the struggle of uh, people who are identified as being black and brown in the United States in particular, the best way to do so is to give the principles to the people and then allow the people to build the edifice in the image that fits the material conditions which surrounds their environment. I think that's what you found in, in Dr. Walter Rodney if you read his um, groundings with my brothers uh, when he was working in Jamaica. Um, you found that he was able to sit among the Rastafari community um, and he was able to get a better following there teaching African history than he was when he was actually teaching at the University of the West Indies. Um, that's what got a bomb placed in Rodney's truck because he was able to go to Guyana 
and he was able to speak the language of the Guyanese uh, much better than he was uh, able to communicate with the bourgeois members uh, in the academia of, of Jamaica, um, sparking the, the, the Rodney riots. Same thing with Che Guevara. When uh, Comandante went to Bolivia, he was able to see that the material conditions did not cause for the same type of revolution that he was able to get with the material conditions of, of Cuba. One, there weren't as many Afro-Bolivians. <laughs> he, he brought more Afro-Cubans with him than there probably were Afro-Bolivians who were fighting against him. So they didn't understand. Fidel Castro was more than uh, La Camadante. He was Oro Dumare. And if you don't understand uh, Bujaria, Santeria, Candomblé, if you don't understand these things, then you won't understand the relationship these people had. And you may go and say that religion is an opiate of the masses, not knowing that Toussaint Louverture was Legba and Jean-Jacques Dessalines was Ogun. You have to know the conditions that, that the end of the people come from in order to understand how to make revolution applicable to those particular people. And I'm, I'm out, I'm asked. Thank you. <laughs> For sure. Thank you very much, comrade. That was a, a awesome intervention. And, and that's right. Um, I think that um, you know, we at Andy Conquista try trying to uh, we try to do that. We try to not be dogmatic like the Eurocentric and European communists who, uh, if you don't follow the the strict, very dogmatic line, then then you're automatically a, a revisionist. Um, uh, but but us at Andy Conquista, we um, you know we attempt we try to uh practice scientific socialism as as um Walter Rodney would say in the in the sense and in the sense of uh, applying it to our own people and, and the conditions and 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 take into consideration the the culture uh our community uh, uh the fact that you know a, a lot of our people are religious and and so on and we have to take all of these things into account even if we don't believe in them even if uh, we don't identify with uh, some of these things, we, we do have to respect those things and, and, and think about those things when, when we're trying to organize in our communities. Um, comrade Vic, go ahead. Yeah, um, so I found that piece was actually quite amazing in the way that it kind of tracks to the modern day. Ironically, it's very relevant today okay. in this phrasing. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I think that, um, you know, it's very much applicable. A lot of like contemporary, like social democrat or anarchist organizations say the same things. They say that, you know, uh, Marxism isn't applicable to indigenous people. It's not applicable to um, Africans and uh, South Asians. So, um, and I also found it really interesting, this part about uh, Kwame Nkrumah, if I'm pronouncing it quite correctly. Um, you know, uh, I, I thought it would be a little bit more interesting to see like what caused that, like why, like, because it's clearly not just the one beliefs of one guy that caused this, this, um, this, these gains achieved by uh, socialists in, in Ghana to be rolled back, um, right? So maybe someone else could pick up after that or help help me answer that. And any comrades, any comrades who want to follow that thread that Comrade Vic has started. Let me see. Um. Nobody, nobody's, um, nobody's saying anything. So I, I'll just say, I'll just add that um, I, don't, I think if, if I get your, your thread correctly, I think that, you know, in, in Walter Rodney's reading, he's saying that, you know, a large part of why uh, Nkrumah wasn't able to achieve a, a successful revolution in Ghana was because he there was a contradiction in his um, ideas. You know, he, he attempted to kind of combine socialism and, you know, materialist understanding of the world with 
uh, idealist understanding of the world, which kind of cancel each other out. Um, but I would, I would also say and, and add that um, we can't blame uh, Comrade and Krumah and, and other, you know, failed revolutions on themselves, but also on the pressure, on the immense pressure of the, the imperialists who, uh, you know, stamp out any sign of revolution, any, any sign of freedom. And, you know, Comrade Nkrumah was uh, attempting a revolution uh, right at the beginning of African independence before, you know, I think Ghana was one of the first um, countries to achieve independence in the in the late 50s or, or early 60s. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, I, I would agree with Rodney in the, in the sense that there was a contradiction in his ideology, but, but also you, you can't underestimate the power of the colonialists to stamp out any uh, successful revolutions. Any comrades want to follow that thread or does uh, yes, I, I have a, a bit of an a bit of a bit of insight on on Nkrumah, um, yes, in yes, particular. Kwame right. um, Nkrumah was never allotted the time that it took to, as a president, to bring forth the type of material changes in a society that had been grotesquely underdeveloped by European colonialism. Um, Ghana was known as Gold Coast before it became Ghana. And when the European industrialists were pushed out of Ghana, uh, they left holes. They didn't leave industry. So they dug and they mined and they left holes like, uh, like they do throughout the global south. This was something that's very common. I'm not certain how much of a failed revolution Nkrumah's revolution was because Nkrumah established freedom schools, the, fra the same freedom schools that trained Nelson and Winnie Mandela. Um, uh, if you look, Sekutuwe trained in Ghana. Mohammed VI trained in Ghana. Uh, 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 Samoa Michel trained in Ghana. Uh, um, Brother Robert Mugabe trained in Ghana. Uh, these Chris Haney trained in Ghana, so Ghana became a revolutionary hub that was set on set upon by all of the world's imperialistic powers. And Krumah's mistake was that he did not arm the working class. He did not have time to arm the entire working class, and because of that, he was uh, a victim of a coup d'état. But I'm, I'm not sure if ideologically his 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 ideology was wrong or off as much as he came in fighting a war. Now, remember, Nkrumah survived two assassination attempts. Um, one, a, a young girl handed him a bouquet of flowers that had dynamite in it, and it blew up, injuring him and killing the girl on the tarmac after landing, coming back from the People's Republic of China. Um, so Nkrumah was definitely a man uh, before his time, but also a victim of his time, uh, because uh, he, his his idea was very, very grand, and he didn't necessarily have the time as president to get it uh, in motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, comrade, for, for that. And I take your point and I, and I accept my, my fault in saying that, um, that it was unsuccessful. Uh, I guess what I, what I meant was it, the, the project wasn't able to, you know, for for reasons of colonialism, it wasn't able to progress. Um, and I think the similarities in, for us Latin Americans, the similarities in uh, Salvador Allende's uh, project in, in Chile, in the sense that um, for the same reasons, I think that comrade USJJ has said, um, comrade um, Salvador Allende believed that he could um, bring about a socialist revolution um, based on Marx's ideology in, in Chile whilst having uh, military personnel that were obviously uh, capitalist and elitist and, and who were never going to accept uh, a, a socialist revolution in, in, 
in, and and one of the mistakes was was that also not not arming the the revolutionary class, the the working class, to to defend the gains uh, that that were made. So thank you so much, um, Comrade U US JJ, for that contribution. Um, I would say like, can anybody or can anybody help us kind of bring this back to to the issue, to the current issue in the United States? How can we how can we apply you know this stuff that we're talking about, which is quite historical and and <laughs> I guess not not very anchored in in what's happening today? Can anybody make the connection? Hi. Yeah, go Hi. ahead. From, uh, Valentina. Yeah, I would like to say something going back to what you were saying about um, uh, that the Cuban revolution was, uh, was not 100% a Marxist revolution, but it had something in common with uh, other uprisings that happened in Latin America. And it's something that in Colombia we call combining all forms of fighting. And it can be uh, peaceful or not peaceful. And for me, what, I mean, uh, being in Colombia and seeing what's happening, uh, I feel that people of color uh, position in the false middle class, understanding that there are only two classes, oppressors and oppressed, uh, need to stop condemning acts of violence uh, that come along the, pro the protest and doing the job of the police by uh, detaining the people and turning them over to the enemy. Because I've seen people doing that in, in the protests in the U.S. Um, I know that... Uh, for instance, uh, political education is really important so people can understand that you don't loot um, small businesses, right? Uh, that's something that we call uh, the liberation of the property. And you don't do that with um, small businesses or uh, uh, black owned businesses or Latin owned businesses. So yeah, for me, uh, I think that's really important if, if we try to concentrate in that, uh, that saying that I was telling you, uh, uh, combining all forms of fighting. It can be peaceful or not peaceful, but you don't, you, you, you don't condemn the ones that you don't practice. You need to understand that there, there are people for everything, for peaceful protests or not peaceful. But you don't say, oh, that's good or that's not good. You're muted, Carlos. <laughs> Thank you, Comrade Valentina. Um, yeah, I was just saying that you know that's a that's also a common a common thread in in this whole thing is uh, the attacks on uh, the attacks on people who are you know supposedly looting and um, you know obviously all, all of you comrades know the the counter argument to that which is you know our people are being looted every day and, and for the last five hundred years and um, you know, people focus on on things that um, that are really just um, things things they repeat from from what they hear um, in in the mainstream media and, and how how we've been educated in the system. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely something that you know us as uh, as communists and socialists and uh, and people who want to defend this this uprising should should uh, think about. Uh, you know, obviously defending and 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 like Comrade said, um, also making sure that we we defend it, but also making sure that our comrades aren't attacking uh, and losing places that are our our own. Um, does anybody want to continue with that, Fred? Or I was just wondering if I could just uh, interject for a second. Of course, go ahead, Comrade. Um, so in thinking about um, the, the comment that the last comrade made, I want to agree with this idea of using a diversity of tactics um, because that was something I agreed with um, from the last reading, why we don't make demands. That reading was, was one that I, feel, I felt probably the most conflicted about in terms of finding points of unity but also finding points of contention, right? So I just want to, I, I want to agree that, you know, we can get so much done, so much more accomplished when we use a diversity of tactics, including peaceful protest and um, not so peaceful protest. 
but I kind of want to go wanted to go back to this in this um, piece from um, the Walter Rodney and I, I kind of want to read this whole paragraph it's only like two or three um, sentences but he says and this was the problem the that bourgeois thought and indeed socialist thought when we get down to it can have a variety of developments or roads and aspects or paths with bourgeois thought because it's because of its whimsical nature and because of the way in which it prompts eccentrics you can have any road because after all when you are not going any place you can choose any road so that's what makes me think that yes we have to be willing to accept this diversity of tactics but when the, when these tactics directly serve the status quo when these when these tactics are liberalism and when these um, tactics conflict with our our stated our stated goal and our objective of um revolution and and the ushering in of you know the uh the dictatorship of the proletariat um certain forms of protest are antithetical to that so i think when when we as communists and revolutionaries see uh kneeling with cops and cops joining protests we have to we have to um denounce that as vehemently as we we announce um like the right wing, right? Because this is just in service of the right wing. So that's all I wanted to add in terms of, you know, the diversity of tactics. Carlos, you're muted. Shit, my bad. <laughs> Comrade Amy, you can go ahead and talk. Um, I don't have a lot of ideas on how to do it but i do think that in the context of the u.s a big problem right now is that people don't have a clear idea of how they want to address the situation at hand because a lot of people do agree you know that the police should stop killing black people but it for a lot of people it doesn't go further than that it doesn't become you know like we should abolish the police it doesn't become anything further than that and so i think a big question becomes how do we get these people to get to that end where they they have more than the like the simple form of cops shouldn't kill black people like how do we get them to come to a kind of a more developed idea i would say of other ways that we're supposed to tackle the issue thank you comrade hello comrades i'd like to add something hello yeah uh just one second comrade is that a direct point to to what Amy was saying? Um, a little bit, and I just really want to add a little bit more on the Cuban Revolutionary and what I've seen of like what Bautista had to deal with with Che and Castro and what okay. they were dealing with them. Okay, comrade, just and one, then the one second. I'm kind of seeing now. Com comrade, uh, that's Comrade Camilo, yeah. Yeah, correct. Comrade Camilo, just give me one second because uh, we're doing. Uh, people are uh, uh, putting their hands up. Um, they're using the. There's no problem, a, no problem. Yeah? So if you put your hand up, we can we can come back to you. Yeah? I just couldn't find that on my phone. Sorry. Okay. If you can't find it, I'll come back to you after the, after the comrades who have their hand up. Thank you, comrade. Comrade. No Tessa? Kind of going off of what people were saying with you know, there's now um, like different routes of of activism right now, I think that's especially important because we're in a pandemic, you know, not everybody is able to say go to the local protest because they might be with vulnerable populations or, you know, some people just might not be able to because of geographical distance or what have you. So, you know, kind of going off again on how there's so many different roads to, to do this, I think now more than ever, that seems to be especially the case. Um, Thank you, Congress. Can I add that you mentioned police abolition, and I was thinking about the text, um, why we don't make demands, and is police abolition a demand, or is that sort of like the goal we're trying to get everyone to like, believe in, or no, it's deeper than that? Comrade. Um, I'm not sure. Was that was that a um, was that a direct comment towards uh, what the last comrade said, or, or is that a, se a separate point? 
I was directed towards Amy, I believe. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, to be honest, I'm very, very new to all of this, and I also didn't fully read um, a lot of the things, but I know that in a lot of the, the platforms that I see people comment on, that is their, not their long term as in once that's accomplished, like that's it, you know, they're going to clap their hands and like leave forever. But I think that given everything that's going on, that's what they're hoping to get out of the situation at hand right now. But um, for me personally, I don't, I don't think that that's the end goal. And I, I wouldn't be able to say if that's a demand or not. Thank you. Thank you, comrades. We're going to go to um, Comrade Tanisha. She's got a hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to echo Comrade Amy and speak to Comrade Takia's point because I work in uh, a working class black community and what I'm seeing um, echoed around me is like most people buying into the liberal demands, right, that are posed um, and just like wanting to, you know, believing that looting is wrong and, and looting is dis detracting from, is discrediting protesters. And I feel like um, what I'm seeing is like this community which I didn't expect it to buy into the, the liberal politics around this is. And I was just wondering what advice anybody has about like kind of agitating and, and doing more political education. Um, when at the same time, I wanna, I wanna allow like my community to make their own decisions about uh, how to address it. I had to step away and go to the bathroom. Um, my thinking on that is a, a concerted propaganda campaign and basically um, how Mao expounded on what it is to be liberal, how to spot it and how to attack it at every um, angle is to create a, um, an awareness campaign. Like people, you know, corporations did, a, well, people did about smoking. Why is that? Well, why is it bad to be a liberal? How does it look when you are a liberal? And, and um, you know, while the moment, momentum of these uh, protests and rebellion, rebellions are going on, also give the people who don't have the formal education on Marxism or socialism or what it is to even um, be a working or a work, working class person in this era dealing with these things, they're just seeing it as um, a race issue, where it's um, a capitalistic issue. So if capitalism is involved, we have to uh, attack the liberal nature of most people in this country that, yeah, they will come out and protest. They will burn down a police station, but yet when they come out to these protests and the police are being attacked, oh no, you're going too far. You know, we need to have a line like who is the enemy and the things that we say about them has to be concerted as far as staying away from liberalism. So it's not repeated over and over again with this uh, theory that we can reform prisons and we can reform governments, those things cannot be reformed. It's been proven time and time since reconstruction. Reform is not gonna happen. So uh, what do you guys think about uh, releasing propaganda to one highlight liberalism and what it looks like and then how to combat it in a actual uh, way when you show up to these protests like you have to have a clearly defined line that says all police are bad all people are good and fuck property in the way that capitalists look at it because property does not equate to life so I think that could help the people a lot thank you comrade yeah that's definitely uh, something that we should be thinking about like how, how, do we, to add to that. how do we debunk to how do we debunk liberals at at these uh, protests and, and and try and get and try and convince uh, you know revolutionary minded young and and just people in general uh, to to our cause? I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go to Comrade Juanes who who hasn't talked and has his has his hand up. Yeah, 
Go ahead, comrade. Uh, hey, y'all. Um, kind of getting a bit lost, you know, having wanted to respond to a few different comments. Um, but from those that I can remember, I uh, was hoping to respond to Amy. And I don't remember someone else who asked about, like, the why we don't make demands um, thing. So in regards to abolition and how we're trying to push that in, like, political education, you know, um, that can look like a lot of ways. Um, but really, it's, you know, using our using our like either local social uh branches or like social media to really push propaganda and push you know um push solutions and create the solutions themselves it's not just like advocating but also world building doing you know arming yourself with those tools and creating institutions to make you know the rest um obsolete and um here's a reading list um i dropped it in the chat um that me and some other folks have worked on and Honestly, not just like the reading list, like the PDFs that are given there, but if you go to the resources, um, there's, you know, huge reservoirs, you know, from like a whole Google Drive folder with black revolutionary texts, other radical readings, um, large reservoirs um, that every time I find a new, uh, you know, condensed list, I drop it into there. So um, hopefully that's a tool for yourself and like that you can keep sharing across um, as we try to like, you know, encourage education and um as for like the why we don't make demands and whatnot that i i understand as not like the overall goal but just a tactic that um some people are sharing in regards to just like how these protests are so um you know there's almost like a sense of indi individualization when it comes to them because people are really trying to take their own approach to it um they're not maybe people are not necessarily all connected to orgs so that you know they try to like spark something of themselves, they are feeling that same incitement. And so um, a takeaway from that reading that I had is that, you know, while we should provide a direction where we see a lapse in judgment, you know, like if we see people working with cops, we should obviously comment on it. And people that are like, you know, on our side, they're trying to be on the street, but don't have the right practices. Like we, we can discuss it, but we also should not try to take down or like shoot down their leadership because you know, this is a moment where we should all be trying to grow together, not, you know, creating a divide amongst folks. And I've been seeing that um, in a lot of different places. I mean, and obviously no one wants to go to a protest that's going to be end up led by cops, but we have to try to still talk to the organizers and be like, hey, you know, what are y'all doing here? Like creating, I don't know, it's, I think, counterintuitive to make um, enemies of people who are also trying to advocate um, for black lives, even if they're doing wrongly, like doing so wrongly. And um, have one more thought, um, kind of uh, relating it to Comrade Valentina's com um, comment, where, you know, having this diversity of tactic and people, you know, doing what they're most best equipped with, um, kind of falls into this why we don't make demands, like logic of if we have a, a very diversified approach to combating the state and putting pressure on the state, then it puts you know them in the bargaining position where they're going to keep offering up until we let go, let a pressure, and um, and that's how we can have like more actual uh, you know abolition and disbanding of police um, of police what are, what do you call them uh, systems I don't know like departments and um, and you know other other ones that we would be that we would consider right now. Um, I think that's all I'm, I'm having to share at the moment. But yeah, you are free to share um, that com uh, the Google Doc, Amy, and all the resources within it. Thank you, Comrade Juanes. I'm gonna go quickly to Comrade Tanisha. I think has a has a direct point to one of the things that that was said, and then we'll go we'll go to the other people who have their hand up. Go ahead, Comrade Tanisha. No, I apologize. I had it up by mistake. Sorry. Okay, my bad. <laughs> All right. Uh, comrade Anthony, Anthony Sid Aguirre. Aguirre. Hi. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, one sec. Um, hi. Uh, no, I wanted to just kind of add on to, you know, uh, the great... Uh, all the dialogue that's you know uh, going on into you know how we are gonna um apply you know the our, our theory right into the conditions that we have now um and specifically for me uh you know i'm down here in the uh 
um, South, uh, Southern California area, right? Um, I've been seeing uh, a lot of, um, at least for me, you know, in like the youth community, um, I've been seeing a lot of this sort of a superficial solidarity, or I guess you can say like a very liberal solidarity between, you know, uh, black, you know, uh, and specifically in my context, right, Mexican youth uh, with, you know, um, with the black people, right? And I think that, you know, one way that we can begin to, you know, really kind of engage in radicalizing the youth is uh, having, you know, a more of a deeper understanding and explaining, you know, to the youth uh, why, you know, we should have solidarity. Uh, but, you know, that goes beyond, you know, the, the, the liberal idea of like, you know, um, just kind of like, I guess, like, you know, holding hands with the, you know, with the, with everybody, including, including the oppressors, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, obviously, I think that, you know, that, 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 political education, that, that work of political education can't begin until we officially, uh, you know, engage, you know, actually start engaging with the masses, with the public. Uh, and so, you know, what, I, what I'm seeing right now, right, I'm seeing um, a huge rise of uh, a lot of like mutual aid networks uh, all across the country. Uh, and, you know, this is being organized by a variety of groups, right, you know, some radical groups, right, some revolutionary groups, but also some, you know, uh, you know, just typical liberal, you know, Democrat groups. Uh, but, you know, this is, I think that, you know, as, as we've, you know, learned from, from, from history, right, from, from the great work of like, you know, the Black Panther movement, right, where they actually met the masses, right, where, with their material needs. Uh, and I feel like this is something that, you know, as revolutionary orgs, they should also kind of take into the fact that, you know, we're facing a time where there's up to 30, 20 million people, I'm not sure the number of unemployed, right? Uh, where you know people are going to be questioning you know the the the, the structures of, of power right what's what's happening right uh, so you know and and you know, going like with with today's topic right of how do we kind of kindle this this flame of like you know revolutionary spirit um, that that the that the poor masses have right that the colonized masses do have inherently right uh, how do we you know rekindle this uh, and 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 avoid it from you know becoming you know just another I don't know like a just another very liberal, uh, um, uh, you know, outcome, right? But uh, I think that, I guess, you know, the, the mutual aid work along with, uh, you know, with doing our own political educational work, right, uh, is, is going to be very important as we move forward, uh, because I feel like that that is where, you know, meeting the masses, right, where they need, right, giving them, you know, giving them food, right, giving them, you know, a PPE, right, uh, showing them, right, that, you know, we are here for them, right, that we're, we're, we're here to serve them, right, uh, the people, and then, you know, that's how we can then um, begin to engage with them and, and have them, you know, question, like, you know, you know, they'll have asked, you know, questions for us, right, and then we can begin to, you know, actually answer that for them, but yeah, that's all I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you so much, Comrade Anthony, and um, yeah, the, the, the points you, you touch on, like the, the specific things we can do to, to help to alleviate kind of the oppression that our people face on the ground in terms of food, in terms of housing and, and so on, uh, are really important things that, that must go with our work in terms of ideology, in terms of tr uh, trying to radicalize our people and, and especially young people. And I think, um, and, and that's the reason why these sessions that we're, uh, that we're promoting now in terms of a study group, the study groups for, for this current climate is, um, you know, for, for example, the next session is, is uh, around that. How, we do, how do we combine our socialist and communist ideology with uh, direct action in terms of, uh, you know, as the comrade Anthony was saying, like, feeding, you know, helping to feed people and, and helping um, people out during the pandemic and, and combining the things because we can't, and I think in, in Che Guevara's reading for today, he, he specifically says that as well, you know, we, we, we have to meet uh, people where, where they are and we can't expect them to uh, agree with us and to join us, uh, you know, just by just by telling, just by talking to them about theory, uh, you know, when the people are hungry. <laughs> I think a lot of revolutionaries have said that in the past, and and that's something that we we have to, of course, think about. Um, I'm gonna go with Comrade Yamid, who's had his hand up. All right, uh, peace, y'all, uh, Comrade Yamid. Um, 
I just wanted to talk to the whole, I guess, like, narrative spewing out about looting. Um, I think it's important for us to really contextualize, like, the violence. Like, for us to really break apart and debunk what the mainstream media says about people looting and of the fact that they don't connect it to the 42 million people who are unemployed, who haven't received a stimulus check, and who haven't received um, unemployment. Um, I think also, um, I apologize, I had a lot of different thoughts. I mean, hearing different people talking. Um, I, I think it's important of knowing, like, we have to understand when people loot, it has to be, like, symbolic of the fact, like, say, when the people in Minneapolis looted a Target, like, Target puts out small businesses, mom and pop shops, more than anybody else. That's a multimillionaire, like, corporation business. They're okay if they get burnt to the ground. They, get, they have insurance for that. I mean, like, we have to understand, like, when our people loot, it is the fact that they're trying to express a systematic anger, and that anger needs to be channeled towards, like, the colonization like symbols as far as people um burning corporations or or um, knocking down statues of colonizers um as far as like what people are saying about people looting mom and pop shops a lot of people haven't done that like yesterday in the bronx there was a protest where black and latino people majority community of black and latino people were protesting like it was a militant protest but nobody was looting other people's businesses as far like you, you had business owners who, who like boarded their businesses up that had to apologize to the protesters because of that, like, this is, this is something that we need, that needs to be said. Um, and I mean, it's very, it's very important for us to really like contextualize the like the violence like the it's not even just violence it's 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 a rebellion you know like we have to understand like when people say it's a riot it's the fact that our people are having popular uprisings against white supremacy and capitalism within the united states and we're trying to stop the clog of capitalism in order to for people to get the message we have to make people uncomfortable the way these police like to make us people of color uncomfortable every single day of our lives so that's just, that's basically my piece. Carlos, you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, comrade. Um, yeah, that's a very good points that you just made. Um, comrade Yami. Oh, sorry, comrade. one more thing. One yeah, last thing. Ahead, I just also want to say too, with the fact with these curfews, or the fact that the, the police state, oh, now I remember what I wanted to say. The police state is taking advantage to be more violent and more fascist than ever before. And also in order to debunk that, that liberal narrative of the police being on our side, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I apologize. You know, I'm a little bit, little bit like tipsy with the margarita right now and I might get a little bit New York, but you know, it don't matter if these police wanna like have a barbecue or if they want to play basketball with our kids, or if they want to kneel alongside us. If they get the order to arrest us, they will arrest us. If they get the order to beat us, they will beat us. If they're generally sincere about being on our, our side, they got to throw away the badge. Like literally, that, this is how you debunk that, that liberal narrative. Like it, that good cop, bad cop, like it don't matter. Like they're part of the state. They get the order to arrest us, they will arrest us. That's just basically it. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, comrade uh, Yamid. Um, and I think, you know, bringing it back to the readings um, in uh, Lenin, Lenin's reading, um, he says, he says something similar to that. You know, you can't, we have, we have to, um, basically what he was saying is we can't um, uh, think of, think of uh, our oppressor as our a friend. Um, and, you know, he makes no qualm about, uh, you know, um, yeah, he, he basically makes sure to, he tells the reader that 
the oppressor is the enemy and if violence is necessary, then it's necessary. Um, and that's something that in the, in the current protest is um, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's like a, a common thread in the, in the narrative of the current protests is, is that the, um, you know, ch trying to hold hands with the, with the police and, and not just with the police, but, you know, people are talking about voting for, for Biden and um, all of that bullshit as well. Um, so yeah, thank you for that, comrade uh, Yamid. Uh, comrade, USJJ has his hand up. All right, comrades. This can, we can really focus everything into three words. Join an organization. We need to get each and every person we run in contact with in an organization. If not, then we won't the, see the major, the major advantage our enemy has against us is that they are organized. Every police officer is organized. Even their labor in the police uh, work is an organized labor. It's represented by a police corrupt ass police filthy pig style police union but in that they're organized in their efforts against us so if all of us can make a priority in telling everyone before we even run down theory are you part of an organization if they say no why not it doesn't matter what the organization is yet we'll speak with the leaders that are elected from the organization, from the heads, and things will come down from the heads down to the people. But they have to be members of an organization. And if they don't have one that they fit in, they can create one. But what an organization would allow us to do, it allows us to unify. Because Kwame Nkrumah said that unity presupposes organization. So if we can, if we can, as revolutionaries, spark the revolutionary tendency in people who are used to being individuals. The system and the conditions around those people tell them I'm an individual, I'm a self-made man. I got this education for me. I'm doing this for me. I gotta do this for me. We have to force, force people into choosing an organization and working within that organization and we will be organized enough at that time then to decide on how we want to move on the pig but we can't move on the pig individually he'll separate us he's a predator he's looking for the weak one in the herd but he, and he'll separate us if he has an opportunity what we see with black lives matters is a mass organization albeit it may not be the most ideologically effective organization from our perspectives but we see things happening in new zealand and we see things happening in Chicago. And we understand that things don't sporadically happen in New Zealand and Chicago. We don't see anyone defecating in the streets. That means somebody had the wherewithal to know people need bathrooms. This is organized effort. An organized effort will bring down an organized system. That's all, comrades. Exactly, comrades. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, and I think that's the purpose of this. Um, of this study group and and you know what we as anti conquista are trying to do is um, you know we're not necessarily trying to uh, recruit people to anti conquista though all of you are obviously welcome um, but you know the the point of this platform is to uh, kind of help centralize uh, you know trying to help our people who can come together and and if they so wish uh, you know trying to organized together in in a kind of common ideology and in a common uh, path and, and struggle um so yeah and, and i hope something like that can come out of this you know not just uh not just talking about theory and you know as as the revolutionaries in the readings have said uh i think all of them um have said in the readings you know you, we can't just focus on on ideas and, and theory without actually going out there and, and doing some work. And, and that means we do, like Comrade uh, USJJ 
says we do have to uh, join an organization, um, preferably <laughs> a socialist or, or communist organization. Um, Comrade Ramiro, go ahead. Comrade, Comrade Ramiro is a, a co-founder and, and co-editor of Anticonquista. Hey, what's up? Can y'all hear me okay? Yep, yep. Um, so first, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Carlos and Takia and all their comrades who put this political study discussion together. The past, it's, I haven't even realized it's been like an hour and a half already, <laughs> but it's been such a, a great discussion. And so I'm just really honored to, to be with you all here because this is like history, right? In a way, we're having political discussions at a very crucial time at the collapse of the U.S. empire. I just quickly wanted to point out two bits that I really enjoyed from the reading list. First, I really enjoy the fact that Walter Rodney explains the dialectical relationship between the first world and the third world, uh, or the core and the periphery, as many uh, explain it. Because, and I'm sure a lot of you uh, as well who, who are from, from immigrant backgrounds, a lot of times, even our, among our own people, there's this understanding of like, oh, well, our nations are pillaged because that's just the way it is, because our people can't just get their shit together. Our people are naturally, uh, instinctually uh, disorganized. They don't want to save money. They don't want to do this and that. And even myself, I've been told that from my own family. And, and it's one of the myths that we have to debunk in our process of decolonizing ourselves and, and liberating ourselves. Um, because Walter Rodney explains that where there is wealth, there is oppression, right? Wealth is built on exploitation. And unfortunately, a lot of people think that there, everyone in the world can be billionaires at the same time without understanding that one is dependent on the other as dialectical opposites in the same way that hot, you can't have hot without cold and day without night. You need rich and poor. And globally, we see that relationship between the first world and the third world um, and within the first world, we see that relationship between the diaspora of the third world and, and a lot of uh, right-wing white people who defend the U.S. And so that's what I really enjoyed about uh, Walter Rodney's work is that he explains that in a, in a relational way and not in a bourgeois empiricist way that understands reality as like, well, this is the GDP here is 90 percent. And, and it's just like not understanding it as, a, as an interconnected process. Um, in terms of the, the last piece I just wanted to comment on on the reading that I really enjoyed is, is Lenin, State and Revolution. And I think as a communist, it's one of the most important works that, that we should be studying um, because it provides an instrumentalist understanding of the state. Uh, what we see a lot of times, and I don't know if you all feel the same way, but I've been seeing it, is there's kind of been two arguments, right, um, in, in terms of the protests. One of them is like, oh, well, let's reform the state. We can get this person out, put this person in, which is kind of like the liberal way of viewing it, right? In terms of individual people are the problem. The other interpretation that I've been seeing is the more, um, the anarchist perspective, which, you know, I, I have solidarity with anarchists and, and I think anarchists do a lot of great things, but I fundamentally disagree with the anarchist understanding of the state um, because as, as Lenin explains in the state and revolution, the state is not a thing in itself. The state is not something that eats and sleeps and thinks. It's an instrument wielded by a class to suppress another class. And I think um, while both Walter Rodney, but especially Lenin as well, really explains that in a good fashion that the state is something that as a working class, we also have to pick up as a weapon and use to suppress the ruling class so that in this, in, in, we're in a revolutionary situation, we can suppress the right-wingers and the bourgeoisie uh, using uh, the state apparatus, but it's in the interest of the working class. And so I'm just really glad that, um, you know, the reading list was just fantastic and I'm glad to speak with you all. And I just wanted to make those two quick comments. Thank you very much, Comrade Ramiro. Um, great analysis on, on the readings. Any other comrades have have anything to say, uh, specifically the comrades who, who haven't had the opportunity to talk yet, I'd, I'd uh, suggest for, for you guys to, even if, even if it's not related to, okay, yeah, comrade, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, <laughs> begins with an X. Go ahead, comrade. 
It's Sachi. Um, just tying into what's generally been said throughout this conversation, um, I think something Bahar brought up in how do we tie in theory in like our communities, like how do we talk to working class, like colonized communities, like about like Leninist theory, like how, like we know it's relevant, but like how do we tie it in? Thinking of like Leninist state revolution, I just think it, it can be done like in very simple ways, but then once people start questioning, build upon that. Like I've gone to protest recently, um, and luckily, like right before I leave, like 15 30 minutes after the police then decide that it's no longer peaceful and they start tear gassing people. And then I tell family about that. They're like, no, they, they can't just decide that. I'm like, I know organizers there. I, I, saw, I know people who've grabbed tear gas and thrown it back. You can't tell me that's not what happened. And then once you go upon this and the question, well, why, how could the police do this? Don't they serve us? Then you start telling them, well, what does the state do? What, like, how does the state, what does the state arise from? And what does the police like come from in all of this? I guess it's just my general point and like how to don't like dumb it down, but like I think just speak of like what's relevant in that moment to the people in your community. Thank you very much for that comrade. Um, yeah, and I would say, you know, just uh, actually just before we came on this call uh, just now, one of the comrades at Anti Conquista, Comrade Ophelia, uh, took out a, a really good um, audio specifically on, you know, related to what the comrade just said. How do we, how do we explain it to, to our people, to our family, to, to our parents who, who you know, for, for whatever, for, because of the circumstances, you know, our people don't have the education or, yeah, the, the ability to analyze the situation from, you know, the, the perspective that we're looking at it from. Um, so I, I would recommend to, uh, you know, after this or whenever you guys have a chance to, to listen to Comrade Ophelia's audio that she put out, uh, directing it uh, specifically talking to our, our family, to our, to our parents. And, and she did it in Spanish as well for, for the Latin American comrades to, to share it with them. Uh, to un and you know, she explains why we should be outraged uh, about the racial injustice against Black people in in the United States as Latin Americans. Um, so yeah, we can do things like that, and we can, um, you know, as other comrades have suggested already, uh, join organizations where we can kind of you know build up our own knowledge, build up ourselves, and and it's sad to say because obviously it'd, it'd be cool if we as individuals could convince people, but, but it's difficult. We, we do have to kind of join collectives and, and to, to get our message across to, not just to our families, but to the wider audience, to our, to our wider community. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, provide our people with content, with articles, with videos, with things like what Ophelia from Anti Conquista just did, which is record a, like a, a 10 minute audio directed specifically to our parents, to our Latin American parents in Spanish, uh, telling them, you know, why, why we're outraged and why we need to take action and why we need to change society. Um, so, yeah. Does anybody, does anybody have any, anything else on the readings? Um, yes, I'd like to add something. When oh, I'm yeah, there. sorry, Comrade Camilo. You haven't, you haven't found the, uh, the, uh, uh, I haven't found it on my phone. <laughs> I tried mm -hmm. looking and yeah, that, that's, yeah, cool. that's cool. Go ahead, go ahead, comrade. Um, yeah, I'd just like to thank everybody that's on here because it's pretty awesome to kind of hear other people, that other comrades that ultimately are coming together, trying to talk about theory and also the most important thing right now is seeing what's happening with with the protests, right? Um, so some of the things that you know I've done and a little background on me and things as I've just noticed myself. Uh, studying the protests, looking at a variety of different hashtags on Twitter um, throughout the country, and even going as far back as just what I understand of what happened last year with Venezuela, Bolivia, and Chile, and Colombia, and a bunch of other uprisings across, across the world, really, right? So making those comparisons and then looking at history, and then looking at the Cuban Revolution, a little bit what had to happen there, ultimately, you know, what what Che, Camilo, and obviously Castro did were, were 
really impressive in, in ultimately defeating a well standing army, right? From what they understood, considering what Bautista was since the 1930s or 20s, being in, you know, at arms with imperialism after what occurred in the 30s. Um, so obviously, he cozied up to, you know, US imperialism from that point on. And obviously, it, at least that's how I kind of look at it, just generalizing there a little bit. Um, but some of the things that I personally have noticed is that I myself was ex-military, um, and then I myself have, you know, dealt with people on Facebook, whether ex-military challenging me and trying to pigeonhole me and under and trying to get me to say certain things on social media. But I would one thing I've generally done to kind of s switch people their way of thinking little by little. It's a tactic that I used since last year, understanding a little bit about Venezuela, is on your Facebook story, Instagram story, um, Twitter, whatever it may be. Um, there's a lot of different things you could do in terms of photos, quotes, videos, pictures, mixed with music, a variety of different things. And Facebook and Instagram, they have music that has specific things where the specific words pop up. Um, so obviously, people could correlate that image with the sound, with that song, with the tones, everything happening. And next thing you know, you get people asking questions about it that didn't understand it. And then they're challenging you on what you know about it. Whether it's very little, whether you're learning as you go. Um, so that's something I myself have been doing on my social media platforms. And the, the former soldiers that I used to train and deal with, you know, they're no longer my friends on Facebook. So obviously, because, you know, reasons like that and former soldiers that I know that are now cops, obvious, well, obviously as well, no longer friends on my Facebook. But it, it's something that I've been seeing myself through them of how their reaction is. And then just through people in general and my, throughout my social media and how they how they interact and even with the posts that I put. So I give them a little bit of what's actually happening. And then I give them back some type of quote that they're comfortable with. And then I go back, like, what, let's say I'm okay. So you give them the quote that they always like and they hear all the time. Maybe the next day or in a couple of days, you put the one where he's talking about racism, racism, militarism, all that type of stuff. Then maybe at some point they make that correlation. So it, it, for me, it's a, it's a matter of being strategic. But what I've done, uh, since I understand psychological operations to the military, um, something that I think that a lot of you should consider if you haven't done it already is look up logical fallacies uh, because that's something that's happening in the protests. That's something the police are doing and know very well, especially the commanders and the officers know very well. And it's very simple. Like everything they're seeing, it's all psychological ops. People fall for it. People don't know. There's, they grew up thinking cops were good, cops were this, cops were that. But guess what? They're not. I myself took courses with cops at, at a university, at a college level, so I could understand them. I talked to them, I heard their stories, I heard what they had to say. And the shit they say, it, it's pretty much what you see. I mean, it's just a this point proven analysis that I needed to understand them a little bit more. And then I made up something saying, I'm not gonna join, become a cop. And then continued on learning a little bit more. But obviously what opened my eyes was obviously when I learned about Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, what the U.S. military did, and I was wearing a, U a U.S. military uniform, being paid by my college university by the military. So basically they paid for my education to basically understand that what the U.S. military has done is horrible all across Latin America. And then I see it when I'm in Guatemala. I see what they're saying. I see what they had to go through. It pisses me off. And hearing their stories, especially at the lake, the people at the lake, a lot of them use their own, they're the people police the lake themselves. A lot of them don't even want cops. Having soldiers is banned. They can't have soldiers there at all. They only have cops there because the tourists could feel comfortable. The petite bourgeoisie from Europe or bourgeoisie in Europe that come there all the time could be calm and comfortable or the undercover agents that are roaming around there to be comfortable. So that's what they've been doing. And I've had to experience a variety of different things in my travels last year to completely understand this. And now I'm seeing it played out in the protests 
And I'm seeing a lot of people that don't understand what's going on. They don't know that they're being manipulated, psychologically operated, and they have no understanding what the hell logical fallacy is. Because once upon a time, I didn't understand what that was before the military. But I've been seeing it, and people are being fooled by it every single second that they're out there with the cops and just talking to them, praying with them, and then the next day they become the prey. The predators are the cops, dudes. I mean, like, shit. They are the, they know, they are basically what Bautista is. When, like, Che had to fa face them, Che, Camilo, and Castro had to face, that, that, that basic was done. But this is 10 times worse. Mm -hmm. These guys have PTSD. These guys have, I've known high school buddies that have PTSD and that are now the most corrupt cops. Once upon a time, that guy could talk to, have fun, have a good conversation. Now he's the biggest jag off in the world that I can no longer even have a beer with, yet alone smoke a joint with. So it's that kind of shit that I've been seeing that has to stop. And the, this whole idea of like, you know, like somebody like Kanye giving money to this, okay, that's great, but he's not going to say anything, right? Why, don't, why doesn't he give that $2 million to give everybody protective gear? Protective gear so they can stay protected from the corrupt cops that are insane. I even have a buddy of mine that used to be in the military that left because he hated it. His dad used to work internal affairs. The head of the union is a racist ass Latino basically that ultimately knows what he's doing because he's he knows how to manipulate everything so i mean his his dad that was internal affairs says that guy is a piece of shit so ultimately guys i mean psychological operations protective gear we got to start getting these people to understand some of this i mean like at the very least headgear if not the, if not mask there's a lot of there's places out there that have kevlar that have all that stuff. There, there's even a Russian Kevlar that I saw. <laughs> I mean, it's out there. Sure. I think that the problem is that a lot of, a lot of them, I feel, is are just too liberal, too, too into what they've been taught, and they basic, they're, so, they're too docile in their way of thinking. And because of that, they just don't get it. I've had these debates on Facebook with people, but what I do when I'm trying to debate them, I acknowledge what they're saying, their pain. Instead of being an asshole with them, I acknowledge their pain, what they think, and I agree with them a little bit, even though part of me doesn't agree entirely. But I have to find some kind of level. If not, I'm not going to go anywhere. I learned this in sales. You understand where they're at, and then you go from there. And then you go a little there, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. For sure, Carmen. And I, and I think like... Um... You know, just to sorry to cut you off, um, but but like how Comrade Valentina was saying, um, you know, you're, you're talking about the way you um, the way you you know try and convince your people on Facebook and and individually. And I think uh, like Comrade Valentina said, you know, all forms of struggle are, are welcome. And um, you know, as individuals, we we do have to, of course, talk to our family, to our friends, and and to people around us as, as individuals and try and convince them to, you know, even maybe not to, to join our cause and, and organize as, as what we're trying to do, uh, but at least convince them of, uh, you know, that not to, not to take what the mainstream uh, capitalist and white supremacist media um, brainwashes us with. Um, um, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. Thank you, Comrade Camilo, for that for that uh, uh, really on point contribution. And, and I think you know I'd, for our next session, you know, as somebody who's who's been uh, in the U.S. Army and, and and who kind of knows the ins and outs of the U.S. Army and, and police thinking and stuff. For our next session, which is on uh, you know more practical things, I, I think it'd be awesome to to have you and and to you know help us kind of think about you know think about the process from, but from the other side and, and things that we can do uh, taxes that tactics that we can use to kind of protect us protect ourselves and and you know protect our, our community and, and our comrades so thank you for no that problem. um no i'm gonna go to comrade dylan who's had his, his hand up 
Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yep. Um, yeah, I just wanted to speak to the last article, like why we don't make demands. I've been seeing a lot of discussion around that. And I was feeling like, you know, very conflicted about it um, because, you know, there are a lot of protests in my city here in Florida. In um, particular, the organizations here are making demands like for, you know, releasing body cam footage, um, you know, convicting and incarcerating the police who uh, have shot some of the, you know, students at the university I attend. Um, and I, I just wanted to get people's thoughts on that, especially as it pertains to like abolitionism. I know that came up at one point um, because, you know, when you make demands for things like defunding police, it doesn't necessarily call for abolishing the police, right? Um, and how do you, you know, kind of navigate between making a demand versus establishing an objective and how you would define a demand versus an objective, um, especially as it pertains to like an abolitionist framework. Because I've been thinking about, you know, our university police, um, there's been a very, you know, hot discussion right now in terms of assault on our campus. And one of the, the, the issues with that is that we've also been discussing how university police does not, um, respond to assaults on our campus. And so uh, I've been thinking about how maybe we should, you know, kind of in lieu of how that article was speaking about setting objectives, if we should start establishing our own councils to establish justice on our campus to kind of replace the university police in a way that doesn't call for the demand of the, you know, abolishment of the police on our campus. So I just wanted to get some of y'all's thoughts on you know demands versus objectives, um, especially as it pertains to like abolitionism. For sure, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Comrade Dylan. Does anybody have a, a direct comment on what Dylan's saying? I have a comment about um, the demand versus objective piece of it. Um, yeah, again, I just want to say that I thought that last reading was really interesting. Um, and made me kind of think of some things I had never thought about um, in terms of um, this whole idea of demand versus objective. And I think a demand is something that um, a demand is something that yes, you're you're asking power to concede. But I think I've also um, come to understand or learn this idea of a transitional demand which is essentially a demand that you know that the power establishment can't, um, can, can never, you know, give in to or something that's meant to, if they do give in, it's supposed to denature the, like, the current form of, um, of domination as it's in. But I think um, what, what I took away from this in large part was to, um, I, it, it is to, it's just like, you know, this idea of a demand versus um, a call to action versus a slogan. So I think um, there is still place. I think there is still place for um, socialist, communist, revolutionaries to to use uh, to use, uh, I guess, a uh, transitional demand or these calls to action as more of a way to bring people into the movement and not really a call for a concession. So in the article, I noticed that there were pictures of um, the, the partial revolution in Egypt and calling for, you know, we like the removal of the president, right? Which is um, obviously something that the power structure doesn't want to grant, but I view this more also as like a call to become involved, right? So when I look at people who are promoting um, abolition as a as a as a slogan or as an objective, I kind of think of that in the same way as more so. We know this is something we'll we'll never win, right? And I think the I think the article kind of talks about that is that you know a lot of movements fail by asking for things that that can never be granted. But I think that's also kind of a strong suit, right? Is that when you're asking for things that can never be granted you're forcing people to really um, reassess the, the nature of, of, you know, the bourgeoisie and, and, the, and, the, and the state, right? So that's how I see it. I think 
I think there are demands, there are objectives, but then there are also slogans and calls to action. So I think these, these things are similar, but not always the same. And they can be the same, but they're not always the same. And yeah, that's about it. Cool, thank you, Comrade Takia. Um, Comrade Juanes, I think we'll, we'll take Juanes and I think we'll, we'll make it a day. Um, but yeah, go ahead, Comrade Juanes. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I'll go ahead and turn on my video. I think too um, for this last comment. But um, to Dylan, um, yeah, I think the last reading also just brought up like a lot of conflict for me. I mean, um, I'm like mo I'm mostly working here in Atlanta, and so a lot of the organizations here were trying to immediately, you know, how do we create demands? How do we strategize? And I'm like, and I was along those lines as well. And so, kind of reading that document um, helped at least like identify for myself that, you know, we can make immediate demands um, for like, you know, our local carceral state and like against, you know, we have like a local uh, closing uh, jail um, campaign um, that we're tying into this. There have been a lot of uh, people murdered by the cops recently in Georgia. So we're trying to like push for justice for them as well. So we're creating like demands that are localized, but while also keeping, you know, abolish like large scale abolitionist, abolitionist demands. Um, and kind of like Comrade T was saying, um, where, you know, things that we know, like, you know, it's not, this is not going to be one um, in the next two months or something, but uh, just the language of it, I think it's culture shifting. It really, you know, it does the work kind of to um, some of the, the comments that um, Camila was saying, um, where, you know, we're trying to shift culture and it's a gradual process. So we need to maintain the language. And like, even if we, uh, while we win, while we make like, you know, whatever, incremental wins or whatnot, um, we need to definitely be strict on what it is that we are approving and whatnot. We're not gonna be satisfied with certain things. And so, um, I don't know, that that last reading though really did kind of play like, kind of, kind of started a tug of war internally and in trying to juggle, you know, how do we bring intention to every um, action that I attend or that uh, a group that I'm working with and organized with attends uh, as opposed, or, you know, without um, stripping the potential away from what it can achieve against the state. So it's, it'll be an ongoing battle, maybe something we will talk about uh, at the next education. Cool, awesome. Thank you, Comrade, um, Comrade Juanes. Uh, Comrade Dylan, you still have your hand up. You want to make a direct point on that? On that? Oh, no, I just didn't know my hand was still up. Okay, my well. bad. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, comrades. I think you know. We've been, I think we've been on here for a little over two hours now, um, and it's been a great discussion. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all for for coming along. And um, you know, as uh, I think it was Comrade Ramiro said, you know, this is something uh, historic um, in terms of you know trying to get revolutionary communist uh, Latin Americans together. Um, and trying to take advantage of the situation or, or, or um, you know, trying to add our, our bit to this very crucial moment in history. And I think that, um, you know, this is a good start, uh, a, a, a study group and continue the study group. And hopefully the comrades who are here are inspired to, to do more than just study um, and, you know, practice what the comrades in the in the readings have said uh you know they they all said the same thing we it's not enough to to read and to read ideology and to you know to know more than others is the, the important thing is that ideology is a tool to to change the world um so yeah thank you thank you uh to everyone who's here um i'm also going to comrade t Takia, if you could uh, put your link up for, uh, I think you put it up already, but if you could put it up again for um, your organization, I, I know that uh, we all need uh, support. Our, our organizations need support. Anti-Conquista needs support. And you know, I um, encourage all of you guys, obviously, most of you, um, most of you are here because of Anti-Conquista's social media. Um, but yeah, I encourage you guys to, to join us, to to be, become part of the movement and and not just our followers but our our comrades in, in the struggle and uh, help us out 
whether materially or 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 even just by sharing our, our website whatever whatever you guys can um but yeah and and then i'm going to be sending out the with the help of other comrades in anti conquista and and the red conduct collective um i'm going to be sending out um the readings for the next for the next session uh which like i said before is going to be about combining what we we've, we've been talking about today with what we can actually do on the ground uh, you know more concrete kind of practical tasks um that we can that we can do especially in in the current climate um so yeah if um yeah if you if you could all just make sure to to follow uh comrade takia's organization riot um and yeah we'll stay in touch Thank, thanks a lot for coming and we're gonna we're going to post a recording of this um on our social media so if any of you comrades have a have an issue with with uh being posted on our social media just let us know and we can we can edit edit you out all right comrades take care thank you uh before we sign off i yeah, just wanted to, just to add one thing um i just want to encourage everybody to check out our uh social medias uh riot underscore revolt on instagram and twitter as well and uh we also have a fundraiser to try to uh increase the capacity of our garden um, to try to um, get get some free and affordable food to our Black and Indigenous and colonized communities. Um, and also we're looking for people to join and of course um, give analysis and, and write articles for our website as well if you guys are um, writers here at all. Awesome, thank you very much, Comrade Takia. All right, see you all next, uh, next session. I'll, I'll send out the information soon. Okay, thanks so much for having us, thank you. All right, come back to Kia and everyone. Bye.